The Grey Wardens are one of Dragon Age's most important military forces, and the reason for this is they are one of the main warriors that in the times of the Blight fight back against the Darkspawn and risk their lives in order to slay the Archdemons and save the surface world from the Hellish Spawn. The Order was originally founded during the First Blight in order to fight back, and ever since they have been recruiting any and all volunteers across Thetis into the Order to help them wage war when needed. Because this order does not discriminate against any race or peoples, it's common that many subjugated civilians like city elves will seek to join in order to find a sense of purpose and fairness in their lives where otherwise there was none. But the scariest part about the order is actually some of its most closely guarded secrets that many outsiders don't know fully about. The most notable of these is the actual ritual that one must undergo to actually become a Grey Warden where an individual must drink from a goblet of Darkspawn blood mixed with a drop of Archdemon blood. Darkspawn blood on its own will kill most people, and mixed with a drop of blood from the Archdemon itself can result in one of the most harrowing experiences a person can undergo. And it's only those that survive this twisted ritual that are deemed strong enough to actually join the Order. And from that point on, after drinking the blood, each member can now sense Darkspawn and Archdemons and becomes especially adept at fighting them. But while in the original Dragon Age game, these Grey Wardens play a very pivotal role in the main story, in the more modern days of Dragon Age Inquisition, that isn't the case. One of the main secondary plots in Inquisition is the idea of, where have all the Grey Wardens even gone? While you can have one join your team and meet a couple others, usually they have dialogue lines alluding to the fact that they don't know where all of the other Grey Wardens have gone or what they're doing as of late. Some of the community have begun to speculate that many Grey Wardens may actually be in hiding, waiting for a secret sixth blight that is about to ravage the world. Could something like this come into play in Dragon Age Dreadwolf? And if it does, could it result in the famed Order of the Grey Wardens coming back once again in full force to save the world? After all, the leaders of the Order must be up to something after all this time in game we aren't seeing most of them. In time, we will surely figure out, but the even crazier and wild potential secret about the Grey Wardens that we can dive into right now is one that might have been under our noses the whole time. You see, we know that the Order was originally formed during the First Blight in order to combat the Darkspawn, but as to how exactly they were formed is hard to say. Some leading theories actually posit that the original formation came from the Seven Magisters of the Tevinter Imperium. But why would that be the case, you might ask? Well, that's where this gets really interesting. Because we know that one of the main goals of the Seven Tevinter Magisters was to usurp the Old Gods. It's why each of the Seven represented one of the Old Gods themselves, and why they all committed to the second sin of joining together physically into the Fade, the original cause of the First Blight or so it's argued in the Chantry and from the Maker. So if we know these Magisters had a vested interest in killing or taking over the Old Gods, wouldn't they then be the obvious ones who would create an order that sole goal was killing them? After all, remember that those Archdemons that the Darkspawn summoned from deep underground to lead them are actually the seven Old Gods that were banished underground by the Maker at least if we believe what the Chantry tells us. Regardless of whether you believe the Maker and Chantry though, we do know for a fact that the Magisters wanted to overpower the Old Gods, and that the Grey Wardens are doing so by killing the Archdemons, meaning the Tevinter Magisters may be the perfect fit for the secret behind the founding of the Grey Wardens. And if this theory is actually true, it may get even crazier, because we know from some lore documents in game that the Tevinter Magisters would be said to have the ability to jump bodies, with some reports in ancient Warden text slabs reporting similar things from the first Warden himself. So could it be that the first Grey Warden was actually a Tevinter Magister, that has now over the years been jumping from one body to the next, leading the Order in an all-out war against the Darkspawn, under the guise that they are saving the world, when really, they're just trying to kill all the old gods, in order to create a power vacuum for the original Magisters. In my opinion, it's one of the coolest theories the Dragon Age community in recent times has latched onto, and I really hope Bioware can at least hint at this being sort of true in future games. Depending on who you ask, Sarah is either one of the best or worst companions in Dragon Age Inquisition. She has a personality that you either love or despise, and in combat provides some useful utility as a rogue that packs a punch. But while on the surface Sarah is nothing more than a happy-go-lucky and capable ally, there actually may be a lot more to her than we originally thought. 
Many players noticed that throughout their playthrough in Inquisition, Cole and Sola specifically had lots of dialogue lines directed to Sarah, talking to her about the Fade and the spirit world, as well as her backstory, which is especially interesting given that Cole and Solas have a special connection to everything. So why would they be so keen on questioning Sarah then? Well, one clue to the answer may lie in the tarot card that we see after completing her personal loyalty quest in-game. You see, after completing each companion's personal quest in Dragon Age Inquisition, the player receives one of these cards full of artwork and of the companion. But in Sarah's case, the card we get has a very striking resemblance to Andril's Valislin. For those of you that don't know, in Dragon Age, a Valislin is blood riding, or in other words, facial tattoos that elves don in order to embrace others. Andril has special significance here because she was said to be the daughter of one of the leaders of the ancient elven pantheon, or Evanuris. So could it be the reason that Cole and Solus are so interested in Sarah is because she is actually a daughter of some great elven gods? Another weird oddity about Sarah is that her body is very different from that of most elves. She is taller, stockier, and very so much so that she's actually unable to wear elven armor in game, instead opting for human garments instead. The reason this is significant is because the only other elves we know of that have similar body types to this are the ancient elven of the Pantheon's heydays, as we see from Solus having broader shoulders, and also in the Well of Sorrows when seeing an Evanurus, it is given a human body model in the game files not in elves. Which, side note, could potentially mean that the ancient elves were actually humans, and that's where humanity originally came from, especially given Bioware has used human models for other Evanuris in-game. But I digress. It seems quite clear that what is being implied here is that Sarah is in fact Andril, or some other ancient and powerful elven. Or, we are looking way too deep into this. But either way, something more is going on than meets the eye with Sarah for sure. And it may even be that she has more magical powers than we could ever imagine, that are being suppressed from her childhood, powers that Solus and Cole are interested in figuring out. Another popular topic for debate in the Dragon Age universe is where exactly do the Kunari stem from? It's been hinted at multiple times in game from different lore entries and character discussions with the Iron Bull specifically, that the Kunari are actually descendants of a much more ancient race or set of people called the Kossith. The Kossith were said to have arrived in Ferelden sometime before the First Blight, and it is actually the Kossith themselves that apparently transformed into ogres we fight in game when the Darkspawn tainted their blood. We know about this ancient and mysterious race from some hints in game and out of game, like from a Bioware developer that in a forum post said the Kossith predated the Kunari from those across the sea. And what would you know, there's a lore entry in Dragon Age Inquisition that has the exact same name and reads, it's clear someone has an interest in the Inquisition, someone organized, with ties to those from across the sea. We've eliminated the Kunari as the most obvious suspects. Nonetheless, knowing they're there does not tell us who they are, what they're doing, or why. They're clever, we know that, and they have resources. So it's pretty clear then that the Kossith did in fact exist and came from somewhere northeast of Thetis, but the question still remains of how exactly did the Kunari stem from the Kossith then in the first place? We know that Kunari themselves follow a strict doctrine called the Kun, and if they stray from it even slightly can become enraged and lose themselves, almost like a rabid dog bred for war. Well, what if that's because that is exactly what the Kunari actually are? Nothing more than a twisted science experiment to create a killing machine of sorts. Here, take a listen to some of the dialogue surrounding this from Dragon Age Inquisition. You know, Kunari hold dragons sacred. Well, as much as we hold anything sacred. <laughs> Atashi, the glorious ones. That's our word for them. Atashi. Why do you think the Kunari think of dragons that way? Well, you know how we have horns. We kind of look more dragony than most people. Maybe it's that. But a few of the Ben Hasrath have this crazy old theory. See, <clears throat> the Tamathrans control who we mate with. They breed us for jobs like you'd breed dogs or horses. What if they mixed in some dragon a long time ago? What do they call you? A Kunari? Your blood is engorged with decay. Your race is not a race. It is a mistake. So could it be that the Kunari are actually Kossith mixed from the blood of dragons? 
That would explain why the Iron Bull and all Kunari feel a connection to them, and also would tie into Corypheus' speech regarding them being a mistake. And even more so, think about it. This weird connection wouldn't be all that weird in Dragon Age. After all, we know elf blood mixed with dragon blood can create elven gods like Flemeth, and that mixing darkspawn blood with that of a dragon creates an archdemon. So could it be that the mixing of the blood of a dragon with that of a Kossith actually results in a Kunari? A fierce and dragon-looking humanoid that most strictly follows a Kune code or risks becoming unstable. In my mind, this theory is as good as confirmed, but the question of how exactly this even happened is still up in the air. It could have been the magistrates experimenting on elven Kossith slaves, or it could have been elven researchers mixing blood samples. It's hard to say. But either way, it's a lore point I would love to see be explored more in upcoming games. In the world of Dragon Age, each race and civilization worships their own gods and deities, with their own rich history and lore, and also all with their very own splinter factions and groups. For the humans, these main higher ones are the Maker and the Old Gods, and for the Elves, it's the ancient pantheon of the Evanurus along with the Forgotten Ones. But what if the Old Gods and the Evanurus weren't actually all that different? You see, we already know that Solus or Fen Harel doomed the ancient elven by creating the veil and removing their fade magic from the material realm. And it was only after this that humankind first made landfall on the continent of Thetis, bringing with them the traditions of the Maker Old Gods and the first established capital of Tevinter. And from those traditions, we also know that the seven magistrates of Tevinter doomed us all by committing the second sin and traveling into the fade, which resulted in the blight coming forth from their realm into our own. But what if this was all planned, and not by the old gods of human tradition, but by the ancient Evanuris of the elves? Listen to this line of dialogue from Dragon Age Inquisition. Solas, the dragon Corypheus commands, could it truly be an archdemon? One assumes that if it were, we would be facing a blight. So what is it then? A corrupted dragon? Simply another darkspawn? It is connected to Corypheus. Such a relation goes beyond mere control. It is a bond. It makes you wonder if that's all the Archdemons themselves are, pets to beings who no longer exist. I would not go as far as that. This dragon is a replica, spawned from a creature who aspires to greatness. No more. Could it be that the old gods, or dragons and Archdemons, are actually puppets for the Evernurus? What if after Solus trapped the Evernurus behind the veil, he also knew they would likely try to escape at one point? Maybe the old gods from humanity's traditions are nothing more than the Evernurus disguising themselves as dragons in order to gain our favor. That would explain the blight as well, because Solus being the cunning individual he is would have anticipated something like this. So when humanity tried to free the Evernurus from their prison, thinking they were talking to the Maker and old gods, Solus had also hidden the blight in the Fade, thus releasing it onto humanity and forcing them to fight and kill the Archdemons, which would in turn kill the Evernurus' power. This theory gets a lot more interesting too when we realize that there are seven old gods in human tradition, but also seven Evernurus in the Elven Pantheon when we take away Fen Harel and Mithal, who were both said to not be like the others. So maybe the gods of humanity's beginnings in Dragon Age are not nothing more than the ancient elven warriors and deities that are speaking to us from beyond the Fade in an attempt to get another race to free them from the prison that Solus has damned them to. It's an awesome theory for sure, and if true, shows that the elves really are pulling the strings behind everything happening in Thetis. And while I understand why so many Dragon Age fans find elven lore to be too all-encompassing, I love the idea of something like this and how it could tie the entire world and all gods together into one much more explainable thing. Liliana is one of a handful of characters we see in every single Dragon Age game, but what makes her especially interesting is that she also is one we can kill in the first game, Dragon Age Origins. The reason this is so peculiar though is because regardless of whether we actually kill her or not, she always shows up in the next two games. And in Dragon Age Inquisition specifically, we'll even remark how she is not sure how she came back to life if you did indeed kill her in the first game. While this is most likely a retcon by Bioware to bring back a character into the main story that players could have killed early on, the in-lore explanation is a lot more intriguing. You see, what a lot of players don't know is that at the end of the Dragon Age Inquisition Trespasser DLC, the following ending credits can be seen if Leliana never became divine. 
Eventually, Leliana became distant and contemplative, often secluding herself in the rookery with none but her ravens for company. One morning, the residents of Skyhold awoke to a great beating of wings and a vast cloud of ravens blotting out the sky above the fortress. Those who investigated found both the rookery and Leliana's chambers vacant, with only a single message left as explanation. The lyrium sank thought into being. Now time is tale, and the melody is called elsewhere. Until I am needed, I am free. Something really strange is going on here. This last message left by Leliana seems to imply that she might be some sort of lyrium mind monster, and would explain how she was able to simply vanish without a trace. And the theory only gets crazier from here, too. If we go back to Dragon Age Origins where it all started, some may remember the quest called In Hushed Whispers, where if Leliana has not been killed yet by the player, we can learn a story about how she was tortured and experimented on due to her extreme resistance to red lyrium and blight. We can read passages in this section that talk about how the scientists of the time were fascinated with her immense abilities and could not figure out what was going on with her. Furthermore, in the Leliana Song DLC, at one point, Leliana starts to hear voices in her head, after surviving a wound that should have killed her, instead releasing a flurry of talking heads that tell her, fight for those who can't, something a sleeper agent would be told. And finally, in the World of Thetis Volume 2 lore book collection, we can find this entry. In Leliana's most vivid memory of her early childhood, she sees herself, a child of little more than four, holding her mother's hand as they stand on the stone terrace of an Orlesian villa, looking out at the cresting waves of the waking sea. Behind them are gardens of sweet orange and lavender, but the only fragrance that stands out to Leliana is the gentle scent of her mother's grey linen dress. These days, Leliana is unsure if the moment is real or merely imagined, but cherishes it nonetheless as it were one of the few images she retains of her Ferelden mother. Could it be that the reason that Leliana is so resistant to Lyrium, the reason she seemingly comes back to life after dying, and the reason she has such a hazy memory of her past is because she's actually a mindless husk controlled by Lyrium, simply set forth into the world to accomplish the task of someone else as a puppet. Leliana was never actually born. She simply is a mindless body that has been infused with fake memories from Lyrium. It perfectly explains all the oddities with the character and may mean that Titans or some other force are using her for something we aren't aware of yet. And considering she's part of the highest ranks of the Inquisition at the time when we play, would have access to the most top secret information available, and that may just come back to bite us in future games. There are many strange and ominous locations in the world of Dragon Age, whether it be the Fade separated from the real world by the Veil, or the Deep Road separated from land by thousands of miles of rock. But one place that many players might not know about is the Void. Said to be a location empty and devoid of life, the void stretches on for eternity in all directions and consumes all. And most scary, no one knows how to get there. Multiple different cultures and people have thoughts about what the void really is, with the Chantry and Chant of Light arguing that the void is somewhere between empty spaces in the Fade, and the Elvish teachings arguing that unimaginably deep underground, you can follow the deep roads far enough until you reach it. This has made some in the community begin to speculate that the Void is actually a piece of space-time between the planet we inhabit, and that either by ascending into the heavens of the Fade in the sky, or descending into the hellish darkspawn-ridden deep roads, one can find it meaning the world of Thetis is actually positioned on a sort of loop. And in all of the prominent teachings and religions of Thetis, we hear one thing in common, that in the void lies our eternity. Here lies the abyss, the well of all souls. From these emerald waters doth life begin anew. Come to me, child, and I shall embrace you. In my arms lies eternity. These are the words of Andraste in some of her writings, and it seems to imply that the void plays some sort of significance in Thetis we aren't yet aware of. On top of all of this, we also have some small lore entries in game that mention short-lived Neverin cults that predated the Chantry called the Empty Ones, that supposedly worshipped the Blight itself, and thus the Darkspawn. They exclaimed that from the words of an all-knowing being, they had learned the truth of the world, that the Blight originates from the Void itself, and that the suffering it brings is actually our salvation into eternity. Going off of this idea, some prominent theories online actually argue that the Void may be the equivalent of the Fade, but with blood magic, not their traditional forms using Lyrium. As we know, Lyrium is a substance that helps mages and Thetis draw power from the Fade to commit great feats like healing wounds, levitating objects, and releasing fire from their hands. 
Maybe blood magic is a similar idea, where blood is the source from which blight magic can be pulled from the void. Could this mean that the void is actually the antithesis to the fade? Maybe the fade and cause for so much concern in Thetis is only part of the issue, a sort of heaven and hell analogy. But either way, it's hard to say, because the void to this day is one of the least well understood places or even objects in the Dragon Age universe, and there are so many ways the lore could go with this one. In Dragon Age Origins, there's a book titled From Beyond the Veil, Spirits and Demons that many people may have missed, and in this novel we find the following passage. No traveler to the Fade can fail to spot the Black City. It is one of the few constants of that ever-changing place. No matter where one might be, the city is visible. Always far off, for it seems that the only one rule of geography in the Fade is that all points are equidistant from the Black City. Dreamers do not go there, nor do spirits. Even the most powerful demons seem to avoid the place. Dreamers do not go there, nor do spirits. Even the most powerful demons seem to avoid the place. It was golden and beautiful once, so the story goes, until a group of powerful magister lords from the Tevinter Imperium devised a means of breaking in. When they did so, their presence defiled the city, turning it black. The Black City, previously known as the Golden City, is another massive point of interest in the Dragon Age lore, and for good reason. In the Chantry's teachings, we are led to believe that the Maker originally created the Fade as the first realm of existence, and in this Fade lies a golden and magnificent city, with the Maker at its throne. Whomever was at the seat was the ruler or the gods themselves. But when the seven Tevinter Magisters teleported themselves into the Fade in physical form, the sin was forever remembered, and the golden city turned black, and the blight was released upon the world. Recently though, Bioware released a new cinematic trailer for Dragon Age 4, and in it, may have just spun this entire theory and folktale on its head. You see, in this cinematic trailer, there's a short shot of Solus and the Golden City, and the events that took place when Solus imprisoned the Evanurus and the Fade. But wait, something weird happens in this sequence, because as the narrator is remarking about the event, at that exact moment we see the Golden City turn black. In his final fight with the Elven Gods, Solus imprisoned them, and created a veil that split our world from the raw magic of the Fade. Could this be implying that the story we have been told by the Chantry is wrong? Maybe the Golden City was not the seat of the Maker, but rather the Evanuris, and when the veil was cast upon the Fade, with that too the Golden City was decimated. This would perfectly explain why in Chantry lore, those seven Magisters saw nothing when they arrived at the Golden City, because it was not the Golden City at all. Rather, it had already become the Black City, and from its roots the Blight was spreading, the same one that the Magisters brought back with them. If true, this would have extremely far-reaching and massive ramifications for the ancient lore of Dragon Age, and would even tie into the theory that the old gods of Tevinter themselves are the Evanuris, and that humanity has been tricked into following the same gods as the ancient Elven. Either way, it seems clear that Dragon Age 4 Dreadwolf is going to bring us some more answers, and I can't wait to finally learn about this pivotal moment in Dragon Age history. And if you are watching this video far into the future after the game's released, hopefully it did turn out as awesome as this lore implies it could. Sindal might be one of the most lovable characters in the entire Dragon Age series. He originally started out as a sort of joke from the Bioware team, but has grown into something much, much more. But the craziest part is just how sinister this happy-go-lucky kid may really be behind that cherry smile. Back in Dragon Age Origins, a dwarf named Bodan Fedek was searching deep underground in the Attican Taig for treasure when he stumbled upon a very peculiar room, and even more horrifying, a small boy standing aimlessly in the middle, sporting hair pale like marble and clear blue eyes that pierced your soul. In this room were giant marble and gold statues, and strangely, pictures and drawings of ancient and mythical monsters that have never been seen before in lore. Some of them were elven and other depictions of dwarven paragons, which are powerful and mighty ancient dwarves. Bodan ended up taking in the boy as his own and named him Sandal. He was very shy, awkward, and his diction was very unusual. And as time went on, more and more oddities began to crop up. For one, Sandal was very adept with magic, as we can see him encase a darkspawn using a rune in Dragon Age 2. But this is especially weird since dwarves usually have no affinity for magic, and this is why many in the community actually think Sandal is actually only half dwarf, with the other half being elven or even a mage. 
This is further supported by the note in game titled Gates of Segrumar, which reads, I only wish it had not cost you, my only child. I could not build the locked barriers that would carve the marks and break the sigil. You alone could save us, but only by destroying yourself. And I let you do it. Forgive me. Could it be that this note is from a mage in the deep roads that has had to abandon his child Sundal, and this is why Bodan found Sundal standing in that strange room? Other theories posit that this note could actually be from a titan, and that Sundal himself could in fact be part titan, or at least a vessel to carry their will, from deep within the deep roads, walking all of his way to the surface. Things only get weirder too when we account for the fact that Sundal can apparently see the future too, as we know from some of his dialogue in game discussions about the future of Thetis and the prophecy he's seen. One day the magic will come back. All of it. Everyone will be just like they were. The shadows will part and the skies will open wide. When he rises, everyone will see. So is Sundal in fact some sort of fortune teller? And if he is, where did he get these powers? Theories range from the Titans themselves to nothing more than a lyrium overdose, which would also explain why Sundal acts the way he does. But even more demented, some in the community have begun to speculate that Sundal is in fact one of the old gods themselves, potentially one that has been slain as an archdemon in a previous blight, and he has come back to wreak havoc. This is also supported by the fact that many people who Sundal hangs around with see misfortune come their way and would also explain the extensive magic powers he has that seemingly come from nowhere. In fact, this might even explain why a random child was found in a darkspawn infested zone deep, deep underground, all alone, somehow alive, surrounded by ancient artifacts the likes of which we've never seen. Whether or not Sandal is actually a demon, an old god, or some sort of malevolent force though, none of that matters when you have a smile like this. The Dwarven Society in Dragon Age has some of the most fascinating lore entries in the entire series, and the story of their previous and sprawling capital, Kal Sharak, is one of them. Thousands of years ago, on the continent of Thetis, the modern conception of the Dwarven people lived in their heyday. They had multiple underground taigs or settlements, and built many massive structures and roads underground. And the most impressive of these at the time was the capital called Kal Sharak. It was during this time as well that the dwarves first came into contact with the newest inhabitants of Thetis, who had recently founded the Tevinter Imperium and were looking for an ally in their war against the elves on land. To aid in this battle, the dwarves at Kal Sharak made a treaty with the humans that lasted for years, and it was so strong that Kal Sharak was even known to attack other tigs or tribes of dwarves if they ever sheltered elves from war as they were the humans' adversaries. But over time, the Tevinter Imperium started to grow more and more annoyed at the fact that Kal Sharak was so close to their capital, and demanded that the dwarves move their base of operations to Orzammar to the west, and the dwarves conceded and agreed. At the time, there were four great tigs in the Dwarven Kingdom, but none except for Orzammar had an entrance to the surface world, and so now with the capital being moved there as well, it became highly relied upon by all great tigs across Thetis. This became a huge issue though when the first blight finally began, because in order to protect themselves, Orzammar caused a massive collapse of all of the deep roads leading to the other major cities, or Great Tigs, and this included Kal Sharak. And just like that, the people of that Great Tig were doomed to oblivion and death at the hands of the Darkspawn, or so the Dwarven people thought. Because over a thousand years later, signs started to crop up that maybe the long lost and forgotten city of Kal Sharak was still alive and kicking. Dwarven traders on the surface started to appear that had language patterns more similar to the ancient dwarves, not the modern ones most humans on Thetis knew, and in no time it became clear that these dwarves were in fact from the ancient dwarven capital. We see more proof of this too in Dragon Age Inquisition, where we can receive a mysterious note asking for the Inquisition's help, and if we abide by the note's stipulations while also playing as a dwarven main character, we get this note back. You follow instructions well. Respect of our territory is a first step and better than we expect from a child of the sods in the capital. We aren't kin, but there may be trade. We shall see. But knowing that the dwarves of Kal Sharak did in fact survive over a millennia of war with the Darkspawn and cut off from the surface world gives us more questions than answers. First of all, how has this city been kept such a big secret for so long? 
Well, in Dragon Age Inquisition as well, we can learn about how different Kalsharok Dwarven traders had in fact been making contact with the surface world for many hundreds of years, but they wore masks and kept their identity and customs a complete secret, focusing on nothing but trading and then leaving without a trace. The question then becomes why so much secrecy though? Why not make their presence more known? And what did they have to hide? Well, here comes the horrifying part. Because the bigger puzzle in all of this is how did these dwarves survive for so long deep underground in a city thought gone against the Darkspawn, the greatest threat the world has ever seen? Well, we may just get our answer from a trader on the surface who wrote about an experience he had meeting a dwarf trader that hailed from Cal Chirac, and what he wrote has led to nightmares in the minds of many Dragon Age players since. As curious as I was, there was an undercurrent I found unsettling. I must stress that he and his helpers were professionals and honest throughout, but there was something I can't describe. While he remained hooded the entire time, he looked me square in the eyes when our deal was struck, unashamed. I lived through a time of blight. I felt the gaze of a Grey Warden and seen the corruption of his prey. Why I remembered both in that moment, I still can't explain. Could it be that the dwarves of Cal Chirac are blighted? But if they are, how have they not become like the Darkspawn? Have they somehow figured out how to overcome the taint and the whisper of the song that leads Darkspawn to their bloodshed? The Dwarves of Kalshrok might be holding the answer to how to fight back against one of the most evil forces in all of Thetis, and considering their capital is in the Tevinter Imperium, where Dragon Age 4 will likely take place, sounds like a good as time as ever to figure that out. To me though, the most interesting part of this whole tale is just how a massive society of doors managed to survive on their own and shrouded in such secrecy for so long, and how their culture and customs evolved with it, while also hiding some of the biggest secrets in the whole series that hopefully we get to explore one day.